So, um, as you know, my name is Phil Hagelberg. Uh, I go by Technomancy, uh, and this is, uh, uh, I have some links up here that, uh, uh, the links from this, from that I'm going to be showing throughout here that may be relevant, so I'll come back to this slide uh, at the end, but you can have, see my blog, my uh, social network, and, uh, and uh, those there. So, uh, as, as he mentioned, here we go. Um, yeah, so Linegan is the, the project automation tool that foreclosure that I've done, and uh, the uh, keyboard, uh, Atreus is, is the keyboard I've designed. And I'm also the, one of the lead developers of the Fennel programming language, which I'll be talking about later uh, as I go. And I work for CircleCI, so if you need continuous integration, continuous development, that kind of stuff, come take a look. Uh, but what I really came to talk about was uh, microcontrollers. So uh, microcontrollers are funny because uh, the word microcontroller just means a small computer. And you would think that the word for a small computer would be a microcomputer, but that's different. That's actually kind of a big computer. <laughs> English is, is so strange. I'm sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> uh, as you know, microcontroller, microcontrollers are getting uh, cheaper and faster. And most of all, what, what's been happening is they're getting more connected. And that's, that's great. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with that. But uh, it can also be problematic. So the more you know about software, I feel like the more nervous you would get about noticing that you're starting to be surrounded by it everywhere you go. Uh, I empathize. It, this shows the, the two, uh, two mindsets. The first one is, is the enthusiast who's so excited about uh, Internet of Things and Bluetooth being everywhere and, and Alexa. And the second one is the, the person who's actually a programmer who says, the most recent piece of technology I own is a printer from 2004, and I keep a loaded gun ready to shoot it if it ever makes an unexpected noise. <laughs> so I'm not that extreme, but I, I feel empathy for that position. <laughs> um, a lot of the time uh, when, you, when you're buying, maybe, maybe you're sold a, a smart device, right? And uh, you, you think you bought a smart device, but you didn't. Uh, what you bought is a, a dumb endpoint. And the endpoint has sensors and a network connection, but all the smarts are away somewhere in a server, right? And as you know, data centers cost a lot of money to keep running. Uh, how long do you think the server is going to keep running? How long is it going to stay on before the device just becomes useless? You're, in many cases, you're using an ongoing service, but you're paying uh, only up front, and uh, it's, it's somewhat misleading. And most of all, it's, it's unsustainable. Obviously, over time, the cost to keep the server running is going to outgrow the benefit of the service provided. So, uh, so that's, that's something that they don't normally bring up in the, the, the sales pitch and the, in the advertising. Uh, furthermore, the, there's the complexity of, of many of these devices. Uh, they're usually running Linux, and Linux is about 23 million lines of code. Or This is two years old, so it's probably more than that now. And it's 23 million lines of C. So if you remember from the talk about Rust, there was that chart, and it showed which are the um, all the different many kinds of vulnerabilities you can have in the Linux kernel, uh, 23 million lines is lots of places for bugs to hide. <laughs> if you're very lucky, maybe your vendor will provide you with security updates. But that, even that is unusual, and it usually doesn't last very long when it does happen. After those updates stop coming, welcome to Botnet City. You're going to be uh, attacking a bank in Belarus, or uh, your device will be involved in a cryptocurrency scheme out of Taiwan, or who knows? Uh, anything could happen. Uh, and so anything could happen with your device. 
and uh, anything could happen with your data as well. Um, there's, there's very little transparency about what's happening with it. You have these sensors, they're in your house and they're, they're gathering data and they're sending it off, but um, who knows? So uh, in some cases we, we do know because uh, Roomba said that they were considering selling the data to uh, various tech companies. The, the data was gathered by um, you know, the vacuum robots and they, they, in order to operate, the vacuum robots have to create a map of your house. And uh, you know, there's people who would be willing to pay for that. And so by the market logic, uh, they, will, they will pay for it. <laughs> um, forget about being able to take that data and export it or use it for your own purposes. Uh, for the vendor, the data, it, your data is, uh, is a resource to export, uh, exploit. And I think it, it paints a, a pretty grim picture uh, in, in some ways. And uh, I think we can do better than this. I think uh, historically, in the best case, uh, free software hackers have, have some history of building systems that can put the interests of the users first against the prevailing trends of the market. Uh, if, you're, if you have a VC-backed tech startup, uh, then your number one requirement is growth, growth above all other considerations. And in many cases, growth is in direct opposition to uh, the need to respect users and to treat them with dignity. So uh, in some ways, the, the free software alternatives can be decoupled from the market and by that, they can be free of this harmful growth above all else uh, mantra. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, there's a path forward that, that can, can lead to a sustainable approach. So how do we do this? Uh, so, uh, I'm going to sketch maybe in very broad strokes to two paths that are common right now. In, in this, and I'm, I'm speaking in generalizations, so, so of course there are exceptions, but um, yeah, the, the first one I wanna talk about is, is Arduino. So can I see who has uh, used an Arduino before, if you can raise your hand? Oh, that's pretty good, yeah, maybe, maybe a third, that's great. Um, so there's a lot to like uh, about Arduino. It's, it's very simple uh, and Part of the simplicity comes for, because it doesn't have an operating system. Uh, your code is the only thing running on the device. There's no, there's no scheduler to preempt it or anything. And that is, I'll come back to that more. Uh, there's, there's more I have to say about that, but I think it's a very big deal to, to have a system where, where it, your code is the only thing on it. The Arduino has uh, a lot of pins here, so a lot of different ways. So a lot of ways to interface with uh, peripherals and and other devices, um, but it basically only runs C and C plus plus. Now, again, this is a generalization. That there are exceptions to this, but they mostly amount to uh, a very small fraction. Um, the Arduino tends to have low specs, so it's it's common to have single digit worth of uh, kilobytes of memory, and it's it's common to have single digit megahertz CPUs. So, okay, you can you can work with that, but um, it, it can be challenging to to make it fit in a, in a limited amount of resource. Uh, and historically, Arduinos have been difficult to network. Uh, in some cases, once you've added networking to the Arduino, uh, in the past, uh, you, could, you could be doubling the cost. Uh, you could be paying as much to add networking as the board cost originally, which, uh, which is just, just wild. Um, but uh, the most important thing, I think, about the impact of the Arduino is it, um, it makes an effort to be approachable to newbies, and I really appreciate that, especially if you compare Arduino to what came before Arduino, before Arduino, if you wanted to work in microcontrollers uh, 
you had to be an electrical engineer or maybe a self-taught electrical engineer, but it was, it was very difficult to, to approach. Um, and finally, uh, I wanna point out Arduino is, is really two things. It's a, it's a family of hardware devices, but it's also a software tool chain. So uh, compiler, IDE, and libraries, and, and standards around that. Um, and so you can, you can, in some ways, decouple those, those two aspects. So that is, um, that is on, the, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we have the, uh, the Raspberry Pi approach. So maybe you can raise your hand if you've, if you've used a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe a slightly smaller number, but still, still a, good, uh, a good portion of you. So the, the Raspberry Pi, by comparison, is very powerful. It has uh, you know, gigabytes, of CPU, uh, gigabytes of RAM and gigahertz speed CPUs. Uh, historically, it has been expensive, but uh, some of the newer models are changing that. Networking is very easy, uh, but most importantly, it runs any Linux software. So you have a lot of flexibility in that. Okay, not, not any Linux software, but, but almost any Linux software. Um, so, so a great range there, but the downside, of course, is that those 23 million lines of code <laughs> are now coming with you for the ride with your Raspberry Pi. And um, you, you've brought in a lot of extra complexity there. So what the Pi doesn't have that the Arduino does have is, I wanna, I wanna use the word uh, comprehensibility. So on the Arduino, you, for every module, you can understand what it does and why it does it. And maybe you haven't read all the code for the modules you use, but you could if you wanted to. Uh, you could understand it. It would fit in one person's uh, brain. And that's never going to happen with all the code for Linux. That would be your entire life just learning it. And by the time you finished, it would be out of date. <laughs> so the, this speaks to uh, a trend that I've, I've seen in the past few years uh, where retro computing is becoming very, uh, very fashionable and people are, people are uh, showing nostalgia about the, the days of the 8-bit microcomputers. Um, and to me, it seems a lot of that is what they call rose-colored glasses. So they're looking back at the past and imagining it as better than it really was. Um, and, and just, oh, don't you remember the good old days? Uh, for me, I, I think you wouldn't want to go back to doing all your work on a Commodore 64. It was, it was primitive and brutal. Uh, <laughs> But uh, but you could understand it. Every every part was was comprehensible, and I think there's some legitimate appeal there that we've lost nowadays. We've traded it for for fast networks, uh, incredible connectedness, and software that can spring up quickly. Um, and overall, I think it's a big step forward. But um, I think it's helpful to acknowledge that something also has been lost. And to me, that, that makes me wonder, what if you could have something in between? So my, uh, what, my, my choice there, my uh, maybe not solution, but uh, I've, what I've been playing with is the ESP32 platform. So um, I'll start with this. This is the this is the ESP eight two six six, and um, it's a it's the same thing as that, but in a slightly different package. And so you could, I mean, I don't know how well you can see it, but it's about the size of my thumbnail. Um, originally, this was designed to, or it, it was marketed as a way to add Wi-Fi to another board, maybe even an Arduino board. Uh, you could hook this up and, uh, and make a connection over a, a serial port. And if you, okay, so 
How many of you remember in the 90s the Hayes AT command set that your modem would use? Neener, neener, geek. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, same, same kind of uh, kind of protocol here. Um, and these these caught on because they were astonishingly cheap, um, but there was basically no English documentation for them early on. It was all in Chinese. And um, as people started using them more and more, they started translating these data sheets from Chinese to English. And eventually what they realized was that this is not just a Wi-Fi connector that you can add to another system. This is a fully programmable general purpose CPU that you can program uh, directly and forget about the attaching it to an external chip. So uh, yeah, so it's, it's a 32-bit Extensa chip running at 80 megahertz with uh, 80 kilobytes of RAM. So, you know, an order of magnitude more than your average Arduino uh, and of course Wi-Fi. And so this, this piece by itself uh, costs about a dollar, <laughs> US dollar. And uh, that, so of course, as you can imagine, this is quite popular. Um, of course, you'll, the other thing you'll notice about this is there's no USB port uh, and there's really no convenient way to program it or provide power to it. So um, what you would typically see in prototyping and hobbyist, uh, hobbyist contexts is this, this dev board that does have USB and breaks out the pins in a nice way and has a, like a reset button on it. So it gives you some some convenience, and this one costs three dollars uh, for the dev board uh, if you if you get it from China. Um, so that's that's really something. That's uh, that that kind of you can buy, you know, a bunch of those, and if you step on one of them, you're not going to be too sad because it didn't cost you much. Um, but I mean, eighty kilobytes is nice, but uh, sometimes it still feels uh, it still feels restrictive, especially once you talk about uh, a system that does have network connectivity and suddenly you're wanting to read data from a much wider number of sources. So uh, we saw after uh, not too many years, they followed it up with this one. This is the ESP32 here and it's, uh, it's, a, it's an upgrade. It's got, um, what is it, 520 kilobytes of RAM. So luxury. <laughs> uh, not one, but two CPUs uh, running at 240 megahertz. Uh, in addition to Wi-Fi, it adds in Bluetooth and as hardware accelerated crypto. So the, the standalone module there was uh, runs at about three USD and eight for the for the dev board. Um, and the, one of the reasons why the the two cores is so important on this, you wouldn't you wouldn't think this is a dual core machine, but it is because um, in the, on the single core machine, uh, Wi-Fi connections are very sensitive to timing issues. So if you wrote your code in such a way that you didn't yield to the, um, to the Wi-Fi routines, you could, you, you, the Wi-Fi access point would con consider your connection dropped, and so it, it felt very unreliable. And then this one, you can have a whole core dedicated just to the Wi-Fi, and the other core is running your user code. So it's a, it's a nice improvement there. And when this came out, one of the first things people did was they took that Arduino tool chain, all the compiler um, IDE bits, and they ported it to the ESP, uh, both, both the older device and the newer device. And, and that's great, it's very accessible, uh, but you can, you can do so much more once you've lifted those restrictions and limiting yourself to C and C++ just feels, uh, feels like a burden. So um, I wanna talk next about interactive development. Uh, and interactive development centers around the REPL. Uh, if you've ever talked to a Lisp programmer, uh, you're not really supposed to read all this, but it just, it shows the, the flow. You've got your code, you've got your, your REPL up there where you can run the code and maybe a shell down here or something else. Um, if you've ever talked to a Lisp programmer, they often get very passionate about the REPL, uh, the read, eval, print, loop uh, that you see up here. 
And so why, why is it something that, that evokes such emotion? Well, I think it's valuable for all kinds of, of programming, but in, uh, in microcontroller development, it's even more so because on a traditional microcontroller, the, you have what's called a feedback. Well, in any programming, you have a, what's called a feedback loop. How long does it take when you make a change to see the results of your change? And on a traditional microcontroller, the feedback loop is, is just awful. Uh, you edit your code, you recompile it, and you upload it uh, to the device, flash it, um, and then restart the device. And then you, you stare at it. And in some cases, depending on the device, you might just have uh, a few LEDs. You have to decipher the meaning out of the, the pattern in the blinking or something. And it's, it's just, it just feels so removed from the process of writing code. And you, when you have a feedback loop that is much smaller, much tighter, it, it really means that you can solve problems faster. Uh, when you do this right, you can achieve uh, what's called a state of flow. And a state of flow is kind of a, a psychological state characterized by just being dialed in to the problem and the code. Everything else kind of fades away in the background and you have this hyper focus on, on what you're doing uh, in the best case scenario. Um, but being able to take this and call functions directly and, and see the results is just, just a huge leap forward. Uh, but also what, what uh, gives you a lot more flexibility is the ability to redefine the functions without restarting the device. So maybe if you're on an Arduino, restarting the device, it's not a big deal. When you restart, you lose all your state. But if you only have two and a half kilobytes of memory, <laughs> how much state do you really have? It's easy to reestablish it. But you throw networking into the question, and suddenly restarting becomes more tedious. You're trying to debug something that has a socket here, a socket there, and it only appears under certain circumstances. Um, you want to be able to load in a new version of your code without having to reconnect, reconnect, load the, the processes that triggered the bug. So um, being able to push out a fix to try it seamlessly uh, is, is a really big deal. It feels like you're interacting with something that's alive. Maybe you're having a conversation uh, instead of maybe you're, you're taking the code and you're shooting it and you're examining the corpse for clues of what happened. <laughs> um, so my, my choice for exploring some of this interactive development uh, paradigms in microcontrollers has been uh, the Lua runtime. So Lua, why, why did I pick Lua? Well, um, normally when, you, when you're picking a language, you pick it based on the ecosystem. Uh, you want to make sure it, you have a lot of good libraries for what you're doing. Um, but when you're working in a microcontroller, uh, it's different. You, you can have all the Ruby gems and, and Python libraries in the world. It's not going to help you with, uh, with coding this thing. You want, you want different kinds of libraries. You want um, you know, RGB LED chains or analog to digital converters or um, you know, temperature sensors and things like that. Um, so sacrificing a, a larger ecosystem, a larger languages, set of libraries is, is not really a, a very big deal in this context. Uh, on the other hand, simplicity, simplicity I think is always important, but it's more so on a microcontroller uh, for two reasons. One, your, your resources are limited, so you, you wanna be sure you pick something that doesn't eat up all your RAM, all your, your storage space. Uh, but in, in a more subtle way, uh, on a microcontroller, you haven't yet lost the battle against comprehensibility. And if you choose carefully, you can, you can retain uh, this valuable property. And I think that's something that it's easy to overlook. So Lua is famous for being small and embeddable. 
most of the time when people say embeddable, they're talking about they're taking a bigger program and they're putting Lua into it. Uh, but it can also mean you're taking a, a device with very with comparatively small resources and running it there. So to give you a picture for uh, for how small it is, the the reference implementation of Lua. So that includes virtual machine, compiler, the REPL, the standard library. All that together, it, it, it clocks in at 247 kilobytes of memory. <laughs> uh, so you could you could never fit OpenJDK on one of these, but uh, you know this thing, no problem. And it's it's quite fast too. Uh, so Lua has many implementations. And LuaJIT is is the fastest, and it, it consistently comes out at the top of the, or you know, near the top of the language uh, benchmark performance uh, competitions. Um, but LuaJIT is not what the. About Rust is at the top. Of that earlier? <laughs> Rust is at the top. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's you know, within uh, some margin of error. <laughs> uh, LuaJIT is not particularly small. Uh, and for our purposes, uh, size is much more important than speed. So uh, we stick with the, the reference implementation, which is also very fast compared to most uh, dynamic languages. Uh, part of the reason it's, it's fast is the, the language has a, a relentless simplicity, and that, that allows for certain kinds of optimizations that might not be possible in a language with more more gotchas, more, more surprises hiding in it. Um, I like to say that if you know another language, maybe a, another imperative language that has closures, then you can learn Lua in an afternoon, no problem. The hardest part, of course, is unlearning all your habits. You came from object-oriented programming or weird equality semantics or whatever. Uh, so uh, it's... It's a good fit for this, but it has a few annoyances. Uh, for instance, it's, it's easy to accidentally set a global if you make a typo or try to read a global. Uh, the, the compiler will, will not catch the typos, but will fall back to, uh, to looking up an identifier as a global. And you can catch that with a linter, but it's still worth calling out as, a, as a, maybe a bit of a wart. You can call a function with the wrong number of arguments, and it won't it won't uh, complain. So you have to be very careful with that. There's no uh, checking on it, and the REPL that it, it ships with is not very good. Uh, you can replace that. There's third party ones, but it, it prints out data structures opaquely, and up until the most recent version, it would not accept uh, expressions. It would only accept statements which is quite annoying, um, which leads me to uh, the next little little quirk is that it has statements in the first place. <laughs> um, that's that's a kind of a redundancy in the language design, and I think especially it's more striking in Lua because there are so few concepts. It's, it's relentlessly simple, so when you do see one place where, like, oh, th why do you have this redundancy? It stands out more. Um, but, I mean, uh, and so, so one of the examples of, of what that means is you, in some languages, you can use an if as an expression, and you can, you can use the value from the if and pass it somewhere or assign it to a variable. And in Lua, you have to construct a, a chain of and and or together to get the same effect, and it can be a little bit difficult to read. Um, so it's, it's a nice language, but it has, it has a, few, a few flaws, but I feel that because it's so small, the flaws are small as well. <laughs> but if you know me, uh, my heart is with uh, with Lisps. I just I get I get such a kick out of Lisps. <laughs> um, so Lisps have no st statement expression distinction. They have predictable regular syntax, which allows them to. Uh, Add macro systems where the, the end user can extend the language in the same way as if they were the person designing the language. 
and then of course there's no accidental globals. The compiler catches that. So, so fennel is a Lisp, and it's it's one that's a little bit unusual. It of course it's a it's a language and a compiler, and the compiler takes code written in the fennel language and emits code written in Lua. Uh, and a really important point there is that the code that um, that it emits is completely standalone. So you have plenty of languages where maybe you'll take, maybe Clojure will take uh, a Lisp code as input and it will output uh, Java bytecode, but that Java bytecode still needs Clojure to run. Uh, it's, not, it's not standalone. And uh, so Fennel, Fennel has that property of, of just emitting the code that, that's runs by itself and it has no standard library and it also has no runtime overhead so any code that you would write in fennel would would have the equivalent performance to the code that you wrote in lua um, so a little bit of a a twist on the zero zero cost abstractions from one of the previous talks um, so i'll get into more of that uh, in a few minutes but I can see some of you are skeptical, and I think uh, you're thinking you're thinking to me, uh, I don't know, that sounds like trouble. I used CoffeeScript, and it was so hard to debug, and it was, it was very problematic. And to that I answer, of course, that's, that's reasonable. Uh, we have to think about what is the cost of a compiler? And to me, uh, the cost depends on the semantic difference between the languages. So a language is made up of syntax and semantics. The syntax is the form, the notation used to, uh, to express the code. The semantics is the meaning, what does it do? And when you have two languages with very little semantic difference or no semantic difference, then the mental overhead of uh, of this this extra step of compiling is is fairly negligible. I found it in my, in my experience. Um, it's a different notation for expressing the same ideas, uh, and uh, so the fennel code maps one to one with the the output, and you can change the syntax all you want. But the the um, the line numbers even will will add up. You can um, because Lua treats new lines. As any other white space, you can the compiler can just go through and only emit a new line in the output when it sees a new line in the input, and then your line numbers just match up, and you don't have to have source maps or any any kind of complicated way of of correlating between the two. So to show you what I mean by that, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up this here. This is some fennel. Uh, on the left and some some Lua output on the right, and I've turned off the feature that uh, that makes the line numbers line up because it does make it a little bit difficult to read. It makes the stack traces really nice, but it makes the compiler output a little bit hairy. Um, and you can see, oh geez, no. So yeah, you can see there the the similarities here are uh, are quite close. Um, I'm sorry, is it, uh, it's probably a little bit difficult to read in the back, but once I bump it up, uh, you can see there's a there's an if here, and it's used as a value. It's used to to determine the value of the, the set variable, which you can't do in Lua, uh, but Fennel can compile that into here. Um, it uses if to set the value with a variable mutation in a way that is um, semantically equivalent to as if it were used as a return value. Um, so it, it uses uh, uses some tricks in the compiler to do that. And it, it, it lets you treat it as if it were an expression even though it compiles to something different. Um, this function here is very close to the Lua version. It's, it's two lines in the body here and it's it's two lines here with a redundant nil there that that the the Lua compiler is just going to ignore anyway. Um, finally, the other interesting bit here is the destructuring. If you've used um, 
you've used closure or a similar language, you can you can pull out a very you can you can put a value here that's a data structure, and it gets it gets pulled apart into these three different variables, and uh, you can see the output of that here. Uh, it made up a random name underscore zero underscore for the value, and then command separator and args are just you know pulling the first three values out of there. Separator, of course, being a Lisp, you're allowed to use um, question marks and all kinds of punctuation in your in your identifier names. And when that goes to Lua, of course, they have to it has to get a little twisted around to be legal, but it ends up resembling the uh, the code from the fennel uh, pretty closely. And you, so you get these bonuses, right? You get um, you get destructuring. You also get pattern matching, which um, if you I don't have an example in this file, but if you if you've used a language with pattern matching and you go back to a language that doesn't have it, it's it's very disheartening. I should know. I I write closure all day at work. No pattern matching. I don't understand why. It's crazy. Uh, you get a few more guarantees with Fennel. Um, when you do this let bind, you know that these cannot be rebound. Uh, those, will, those will stay to their uh, original values. If you do need something that will be rebound, you get you put in a var. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a courtesy to the reader. You're saying, hey, hey pay attention. Uh, this is going to change, so it's it's uh, you gotta you gotta be more aware. Whereas um, you know anything that comes in as an argument, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and finally, uh, you can do uh, ARD checks optionally. You can you can have the fu have functions that ensure that they're called with the right number of arguments. And there's a convenient notation for doing that. Uh, of course, there is performance overhead there. But um, it would it would emit the same kind of checks that you would write in Lua anyway. But uh, it's it's just a nice shorthand for it. So so Fennel is is very simple. the The entire compiler is about two thousand lines of Lua, but uh, at the same time, I feel like it, it offers uh, enough expressive power to be worth that small cost of additional overhead. Uh, and the biggest strength of Fennel, I think, is how ubiquitous Lua is. You can find it in, um, you know, all over video games, uh, window managers, databases, web servers, uh, and of course, uh, you know, cheap microcontrollers. <laughs> so that brings us back to um, to here. How uh, how do we do that? How do we get Lua on this device? So this is, this is a project called Lua RTOS that, that runs on the ESP32. Um, and when I submitted the talk, I titled it Lisp on Node MCU. Node MCU is an alternate firmware that only runs on the ESP8266. So um, I'm focusing more on this now. I didn't realize this existed when I wrote the proposal, but uh, most, of the, most of the concepts are very similar. Um, but this, yeah, so this is Lua RTOS. It's a port of Lua to the ESP32 platform. So it provides that Lua runtime and it sits on top of something called free RTOS, which is this, uh, which is a real time operating system for microcontrollers. And uh, even though it's called an OS, it's not much like Linux or Windows. It's, uh, you know, it makes you start to think, what even is an operating system, right? <laughs> uh, it's, the operating system is, is all about exposing the capabilities of the underlying hardware to your application code. And that's what you see on most computers. That means uh, display disks, keyboards, um, the mouse. On the ESP32, that means the, the pins, the, it's called GPIO pins, maybe the serial port, the I2C bus or the flash storage, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I was I was digging into this more, and I was I was very impressed by how how complete it it is. Uh, it also includes uh, a shell, which microcontroller operating systems never do. 
uh, the, their shell is based on Lua. Uh, and uh, even a text editor, like a visual nano style text editor, you can operate by connecting over, over USB, uh, which is just completely unheard of outside the Pi. Um, and then finally, uh, and maybe most important for uh, what I want to talk about, it, it has an implementation of MDNS, which is also known as ZeroConf, also known as Avahi or uh, Bonjour on uh, Apple's platforms. And the, the point of, of that technology is that a you can have a device like this that publishes its IP address uh, to other devices on the, the LAN and it has a like a dot local host name and then anyone can can visit it without having to to worry about dns records or anything like that so uh really useful for for this kind of situation and especially when you contrast it with uh traditional uh smart devices on a traditional smart device or maybe like a mass market uh smart device if your home internet goes down, then you lose control over your device. But your device is still connected to your router, right? Your laptop is still connected to the router. Like there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to speak to each other other than the, the vendor has decided to construct this architecture of centralization and it puts them in the middle in control of, of all the flow of data. And you don't notice that until your internet goes down and then, then you realize this doesn't make sense. It, doesn't, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't take my device down just because I can't reach the outside world. My device is here in my home. Um, why do I need a middleman? So I got very excited when I read that serverless software is the next big thing and it's going to be it's going to be the big trend and then i got very disappointed because i found out that serverless software is just about a different kind of server <laughs> because if you want to talk about actually serverless software it's so much more interesting than you know some cloud providers some cloud providers api that they just announced you know uh, if a, if a system is actually serverless then you're talking about introducing decentralization. And I think that decentralization has the potential to put power back in the hands of the users, uh, especially uh, as we've seen many of the corrupting influences of centralization uh, on, you know, most prominently on, on social networks, but uh, other places as well. And it's, it seems to me that if you're talking about actually serverless software, it's never going to come from a typical uh, Silicon Valley startup. Software developed by those kind of companies, uh, it always tends towards centralization because monetization, as it's, as it's practiced in Silicon Valley, it requires centralization. And when, when push comes to shove, monetization always wins and beats out the other concerns. So uh, I'm giving the keynote, right? I, I think, uh, or a keynote. And I think that means I can talk about something a little more personal, uh, but maybe also bigger picture. Uh, so I'll tell you a bit of a story about how I used to be a, a true believer in, in open source. So when I was in school, I, I read the GNU manifesto and I was drawn in by by these ideas of sharing with others and about building a community around software. And then I read some other works about open source and I thought to myself, oh, this is the same thing as that, which is a very common mistake. Uh, so contributing to open source, it feels pretty good, right? It feels like you're giving a gift to humanity and you start to think about it and Okay, you're giving a gift at least to other computer users. Well, in many cases, okay, you're giving a gift to other programmers. Well, maybe you're giving a gift to the people who employ the programmers. And I think 
in many cases, open source is considered to be a gift economy, uh, which is a kind of an anthropological term about um, yeah, how, how we interact with each other through, through giving gifts. And I believe that's a misconception. Uh, I believe free software is a gift, trend, a gift economy, but if you understand it correctly, the open source should be considered transactional. So let me unpack that a little. Uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with, with some of the backgrounds there, uh, free software is a political movement that exists to empower users by public collaboration in order to produce software in a way that hopefully it cannot be subverted against the users. Open source is a methodology that uses that same method of, of public collaboration to produce software for any purpose, regardless of the effect on end users. So you can see how there would be confusion. They do overlap, but the, the goals are completely different. Uh, when I say open source is transactional, uh, I mean that you can you contribute code and you gain reputation. And you, when you gain reputation, you have access to maybe a, a better job or something along that lines. And open source has treated me very well, so I hope you don't see me as complaining. I have no grounds for complaint, uh, but I want people to see what's, what's really going on. Uh, I want people to see it for what it is. When you think of it as a gift economy, then other people might think of it as a way to benefit from unpaid labor to pursue business goals. And you want to go into it with eyes open. Uh, it took me a long time to recognize that dynamic. And I think that's largely because uh, open source has succeeded at co-opting the goodwill of the free software movement. They strip away the political aspects which are about the end user and, and empowering them. And somehow they're able to keep the, the fuzzy feel good vibes. Um, when, I, when I did start to realize this, honestly, I, I became less inclined to do open source in my free time. Um, but I still wanted to write code and to make things. That's that's just part of who I am. So I, I began, I changed, shifted in, in my focus and uh, I worked more on writing games with my children uh, and, and programming microcontrollers uh, and making things for humans to enjoy and not libraries or web services or distributed systems. So I, I hope you don't see me as saying to ignore open source, because I'm not saying that. I'm not saying to shun it. I'm, uh, it's not going away, of course. Uh, I, just, I just hope that people can understand, understand it for what it really is. And uh, I, th I believe it makes a terrible religious cause. Uh, you don't want to be a true believer. But my hope is that you would take this, this technology, or maybe some other technology. It doesn't have to be this. Uh, and build something for humans. So you don't need to reach for maybe those, those tools that you use at your day job as a programmer. Uh, it's not always a good fit for that. Um, I want those tools, you should be aware of how those tools make assumptions about centralization and scalability. And those assumptions can overcomplicate things terribly. Uh, they, they tear away at the foundation of comprehensibility and you can easily become blind to them and you just start to think this is just how serious software is done and it has to be this way. But you can do things dramatically simpler if you're producing something just for on a human scale, even if it's not something that would fly at work. So if, if you're fortunate enough to work in software, but you still feel the drive to code in your free time, I hope maybe that's something you can aspire to, whether that's microcontrollers or interactive development or some other way, uh, more power to you. And uh, I wish you happy hacking.
We have questions for Phil. Preguntas. Hi, Phil. Uh, thanks in the first place. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful for uh, about all your job, all your efforts on planning that tool. I use it on a daily basis, so thanks for that. Um, I for sure I, I'm gonna give a try on uh, Fennel. Um, I was wondering. You mentioned that uh, it wasn't or at least I understood that uh, you didn't try it on an ESP8266. Uh, but as I understand that you can upload Lua code to a node MCU, did you ever uh, try that? Or do you know if that works? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was a little bit unclear about that, I think. Um, I, uh, I was focusing more on the, the newer device, but um, you, you definitely can do that. Um, you can upload the Lua code onto here. What you can't do is run the Fennel compiler. So um, it gets more complicated. You have, to, you have to set it up so that you're doing the compiling on the PC, and then you're sending the Lua code to here. You can still do it. I, I, I wrote an IRC bot uh, on this, and it's a lot of fun, but, um, but it, it is nicer to have the extra memory and to, to feel like the restraints are a little less uh, less severe. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. I, uh, I'm glad to clarify that. Um, I also, I brought with me some devices that um, I don't really need to take back. So maybe the first three people to come up can, uh, can take away a device if you're interested in uh, after, after the questions are all done. <laughs> More questions? Uh, that was really fun. I have two very different questions. Um, one is, uh, I thought what you said about open source was very useful. There's a talk by Heather Miller that she gave at Lambda Days in 2018, where she points out that we're depending more and more on open source, but fewer and fewer people are contributing to some of the really key open source stacks. Mm -hmm. So that's a compliment to what you said. I want to mention it to everybody. I think the video's online. Can and you repeat I, the name of the speaker? Sure, Heather Miller. It was at Lambda Days 2018, and the talk was called We're Building on Hollowed Foundations, Worrying Trends in Open Source and What You Can Do About It. Thanks. So, um, yeah, Heather Miller's an interesting person. So I just wanted to mention that as a compliment to what you said. I also wanted to ask, so Fennel looks really cool. How many people are using it? Is it just you? Ah. There's, a, there's someone who's seen uh, many uh, flash in the pan languages or personal projects. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I gave the first version of this talk at FennelConf 2019, which was in Portland, and just eight people came. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, it was, uh, you know, that's, that's the number of people who are willing to come to Portland to, to see a small software conference on it. Um, I think we have maybe 30 people in the IRC channel. So it's, it's not just me. It's, uh, I think there's, there's been maybe 15 contributors. Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed doing with it is uh, building games, uh, oftentimes with my kids. And... Uh, there's a twice a year. There's a Lisp game jam, uh, and the past three game jams have been won by Fennel Games, uh, and I think maybe maybe eight to ten uh, entries total. So uh, it's small, but um, it's it's I feel like it's it's strategically placed where you can do a lot with a little, and and piggyback on that existing uh, deployment of of Lua. Um, Lua, you know, the, the Lua virtual machine, that, that runtime. Um, yeah, uh, great question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, 
hello, uh, great talk. Uh, one comment, um, we're in South America, we speak Spanish natively, so it's okay. We know very well the difference between free software and open source. Uh, so it, it's, it's very good that you mentioned it, by the way. You um, don't have that same problem of free can mean two things. That's, no, that's no, no, good. Not, not really. <laughs> that, that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, Actually, we use uh, software libre and uh, mm. open source as mm -hmm. in English, so it's it's okay normally. Yeah. Well, depends. Probably companies don't do it that way, <laughs> but it's their choice. Mm. My question is a pragmatical one. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to use the closure uh, build chain? I mean, the building tools to work on funnel. I mean, like uh, Emacs or Space Max or Veeam or Whatever. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the so many of the tools in Closure will not make any sense in Fennel because, for instance, Linegan, uh, you have a completely separate dependency mechanism, and in the Lua world, uh, transitive dependencies are much less common. So um, you can. You can manually manage dependencies in many cases, and there's no there's no big deal. Um, you know, you would never do that on a large closure project. But if I'm working on a game that has no network component, um, I I'm not concerned about getting security updates, so I I can dump all the dependencies just in the source tree. Um, but a, another angle on that is um, the nREPL protocol is used by by closure, in some ways, it's a precursor to LSP, where it's it's editor agnostic, uh, and it, it allows it allows access to it focuses on the REPL rather than LSP is is very much more static analysis, but it it has that same philosophy of let's define one standard, and many languages can use it, and many editors can use it, and we all get along. And so I wrote. Uh, an nREPL server in Lua before Fennel existed. And you can use uh, the existing clients for nREPL in Emacs or in the command line, probably in Vim. I haven't tried it. <laughs> um, and they all just work there. And then um, I took that nREPL server and I added a middleware that would compile the incoming code from Fennel to Lua and then pass it in. And, uh, and it works great. And it's like 100 lines. <laughs> Uh, so you can you can piggyback on some of the existing uh, tooling there in a, in a way that is is quite convenient. Yeah, because I think that uh, if you really want to incentivize people to use that language, uh, just showing them that there is an easy way to hack it, yeah, it would be very helpful. <laughs> Thank you very much for your great uh, talk. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, first of all, a uh, very short, close question. Can I use Fennel to uh, develop on Arduino? Uh, can I use Fennel to develop on Arduino? Um, so like I said, Arduino has two meanings. You can talk about Arduino as a, a family of microcontrollers, or you can talk about Arduino as a software ecosystem. And it will not work on the software ecosystem. Um, I, I think you could probably find some devices that are Arduinos that have enough memory to run uh, to run it, but I um, so the Arduino family does have a range of um, of you know there's some on the on the larger end I think some of them might have enough, but I I haven't really looked into it. Um, Okay, and second, is there any uh, specific uh, political action that we as developers can take in the community to endorse what, or at least uh, make sp explicit what you were saying, which is very important? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I don't know. You're, uh, I just want to hear your thoughts, at, for example, on the GPL and that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I think... I wish I had a really good answer. I wish I wish I, I, I think about it a lot, and it's Me too. Um, it's not something I it's, it's not something I, I have a call to action on. But um, 
I think there's uh, there's a sense in which we we want to we should be uh, we should try not to normalize the idea of uh, you know a, a company that comes in and takes advantage of unpaid labor and has expectations beyond just the code. Um, I think that's that's somewhat common. Uh, you, you talk about developer burnout, and um, of course, take the code. That's what it's there for. But the expectation that oh, you you need to fix this bug for me. Um, I think we could, uh, as developers, if we're working in a company that uses open source, we should try to uh, try to to push for having it be done in a sustainable way. And if a developer does take uh, monetary contributions, encourage the company to uh, to contribute to that. Uh, especially if there are, you know, hey, we need this bug fixed or this one feature would be really nice and and try to try to push it in the direction of sustainability. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, good evening. Uh, I'd like to ask you what you think about the affair of a GPL license if it's can help in the open source uh, free software issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, man, that's a uh, that's a really good question. The the GPL license is very clearly political, and it's it it's uh, because of that. There's been many companies who see it as if it's poison, and um, they, you know, in many time I've I've had this happen multiple times where I've been at a company and they do a license review and they, they say, we need to list out all our dependencies just to make sure that we don't have GPL. And um, so for me, when, I, when I'm when i at work, of course, um, if I'm releasing something, then uh, it's going to be, it's going to be owned by the, the company who's paying me. But when I'm doing work in my free time, uh, then I I'm typically would would like to release. So all the games that I've released have been under the GPL. Of course, the there's not a lot of uh, you know companies rushing into uh, build on a game. But <laughs> um, yeah, I mean I think I think it's it's helpful. Because it's it's what it's there for. It's it's the the explicit um, intent of the license. But at the same time, there's a there's a cultural aversion to it that uh, makes it a little bit less effective than it could be. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Hi, uh, can you talk about your keyboard you made? Oh, I was hoping you'd ask about that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so this is uh, this is called the Atrius keyboard. It's a it's a mechanical keyboard kit that um, it's got 42 keys and uh, it's it's very DIY. So um, if you'll pardon the brief commercial interlude, um, I sell these on my website and I have a few in my bag here. If you want to avoid the shipping and duties. Um, but you you put it together yourself. You solder it. You finish the wood, and uh, it's it's very comfortable. Um, and it takes it's it's a little bit difficult to get to use to, to get to learn. Uh, it takes takes a while, but once you learn it, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs>